Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this IANA webinar, What's Driving Intermodal? We're really pleased to have you here today. We've got a great lineup. Really, it brings me great pleasure to, to be able to, to bring two great economic voices for the industry together. Pat Casey, the Vice President of Fleet Management at TCX Company, and Lee Klaska, a Senior Analyst at Transportation and Logistics at Bloomberg Intelligence. And they're going to walk us through a lot of really interesting pieces today. So without further ado, I am going to kick it over to Lee. Great. Thanks, Al. And just uh, for a disclosure, uh, that is a younger version of me that you're seeing right now on the presentation. Most of the slides I'm going to be showing you today are going to be from uh, the Bloomberg Terminal. They're going to be snapshots. And, you know, what I wanted to kick it off with is to talk about the economy. What we have here is uh, GDP expectations by consensus uh, for uh, the U.S. And you can see the 2Q number is kind of the trough of the declines that are to be expected. And, you know, this is really being driven by the recessionary pressures from the ripple effects from the coronavirus pandemic, coupled with the impact of $25 a barrel crude oil on the oil and gas sector. You know, these two factors will weigh on demand across all modes of freight transportation, including marine shipping, rail, trucking, and parcel volumes. And, and there's no doubt that we're in the midst of a recession. You know, Bloomberg Economics, U.S. recession and probability model is currently at 100 percent. And this tells you that, uh, you know, the, the probability of being a recession in the next 12 months. And, and we it seem to be definitely uh, in the midst of that. You know, and economic ex expectations will continue to be moderated lower, uh, in our view, as the reality stay-at-home orders settle in. And, you know, like I said earlier, the brunt of the downturn is going to be in the second quarter. Our uh, economists at Bloomberg are expecting 9% GDP decline uh, in their base case and a 14% decline in, in their bear case scenario. And, you know, we believe there's more downside risk to the consensus estimates as, you know, we don't think most companies have fully grasped the impact to earnings, especially since most of the stay-at-home orders are going to be, uh, you know, impacting the, the second quarter. And this backdrop is really weighing on freight transportation shares. They've all underperformed the broader markets. Uh, truckload stocks uh, were the worst. Uh, they're down 22% year-to-date, followed by uh, parcel providers. Uh, they're down 16%. Uh, LTL and railroad stocks are down around 10%, uh, and that's versus uh, a 9% decline for the for the S&P. So what this shows you is the price of uh, diesel and the price of uh, crude oil, uh, WTI. You can see they, uh, they they closely mirror one another until recently, you know, with the collapse in crude oil prices. We believe that companies are going to face major deflationary pressures from a, a combination of low oil prices, weak commodity prices, a strong dollar, rising labor slack, and abundant spare capacity. You know, headline inflation, inflation will probably uh, quickly fall into negative territory due to the collapse in energy prices. The lower diesel prices will help mitigate the impact from falling demand on margins for freight transportation providers, but, you know, it's still going to uh, not be enough to uh, mitigate or offset completely the impact to earnings. You know, and the glutton oil prices have also created one of the best crude tanker markets. So while everyone else is, is kind of suffering here, the crude tanker market is doing well, uh, which has been led by a steep contango curve and demand for floating storage, which is also being exasperated by limited onshore alternatives. What we have here are charts from our quarterly truckload survey. We do it with uh, truckstop.com. And these are our latest uh, results, which uh, we were published uh, back in uh, April. The, the coronavirus is crushing blow to, to freight demand prospects drove some of the weakest truckload sentiment we've ever seen from our quarterly survey. Concerns over the coronavirus shock to freight activity drove trucking volume growth expectations over the next six months to the weakest levels that we've seen since we started the survey in 2013. Only about 36% of the respondents uh, of the survey expect volume to rise. Uh, and about 61% of the respondents stated that uh, COVID-19's greatest impact would be the reduce in demand for the industry, followed by more truckers leaving uh, the market due to, to weakness and bankruptcies. Spot trucking capacity was reduced about 19% so far this year, according to data from truckstop.com. Reefer drivers were, were most optimistic, probably because of they saw an increase in demand for grocers and, and medical supplies as a surge of freight kind of appeared uh, back in March. And only 27% of truckers expect spot rate X fuel 
to rise over the next six months. And this is more pessimistic than the levels that we saw in the fourth quarter and 39 percentage points lower than we saw last year. Uh, spot rates have finally lapped grueling comparisons from last from uh, 2018 when a combination of factors created an extremely tight market. And prior to COVID-19 effects, you know, our channel checks were pointing to a more balanced market by the second half, which is probably going to be uh, pushed out at the earliest in the fourth quarter as increased carrier bankruptcies, higher insurance costs, and more use of hair follicle testing may not be enough to offset weak uh, freight prospects, at least in our view. What we have here uh, are the truckstop.com market demand index and some spot rates. The market demand index, or MDI, uh, measures relative supply and demand in the spot market. You know, we saw some recent strength over the last week, but it's still down significantly year to date. Uh, that's obviously being driven by, you know, demand kind of uh, fell off about three or four weeks ago after the the initial surge in demand. And, you know, the, the, the spot market's uh, probably getting hurt more than the contractual market in our, in our view. You know, this is uh, monthly contractual trucking rate data available uh, on the Bloomberg terminal at the truckloadrate.com. You know, we've seen the contractual market go down uh, year over year for eight uh, consecutive months. The latest reading was in uh, March, and, and that fell about 1.9% decelerated from February is 2.6%. Uh, March reading marks, like I said, the eighth consecutive monthly decline. You know, while that's, I guess, a little encouraging that it, the decline isn't accelerating, you know, the sharp reduction in freight activity that we're seeing in the subsequent weeks and uncertainty over the length and magnitude of the virus-related recession should delay any near-term rate recovery in our view, which was originally anticipated in the second quarter. You know, shippers may look to work with more financially secure providers in the coming weeks, and this could push, uh, again, kind of the weaker, smaller players out of the market and get some of that excess capacity out of the market that definitely needs to, to be. You know, what we have here is data from uh, the Associations of American Railroads. It's uh, intermodal data. I'm just going to touch briefly on this. You know, and, and this is kind of, uh, you know, the weakness that we're seeing in the trucking market is obviously bleeding into the intermodal market. You know, uh, intermodal car loads fell 13% in the week ending May 2nd versus the prior year, uh, with all Class 1s recording declines. The Canadians, uh, CN and CP, performed better on a relative basis, which we expect could persist as their networks are better positioned to kind of fend off the, uh, the softer trucking market and lower fuel prices uh, given their longer lengths of, of haul. In Kansas City, Southern has been probably impacted the most, and it trails its peers. Uh, and that's probably due to its cross-border exposure and pressures from reduced consumer demand and lower auto parts exports to Mexico. You know, the, the international portion uh, will, you know, a pickup in that will really be driven, obviously, by U.S. import activity. You know, while the Chinese uh, factories appear to be coming online, you know, just because they're online doesn't mean they're going to be exporting stuff to the U.S. as, you know, consumer confidence is kind of rattled and unemployment rates soar, um, people's um, wanting to spend on non-essential items is probably going to be pretty limited in the, in the coming quarters uh, and kind of will probably uh, weigh on uh, inter intermodal uh, volumes this year. And that's really on top of, you know, a retail industry that's suffering and, you know, already had high inventory levels uh, going into the, the pandemic. Here we have some intermodal related rates. Container rates from China to the West Coast are, are down about 12% on average. Uh, and this is really driven by the amount of slack capacity that the liners have. You know, they've been trying to kind of mitigate that through blank sailings. However, uh, there, there still is a lot of slack capacity out there. And, you know, a limited availability of empty uh, containers are kind of weighing on the supply chain as it goes, as, as, as it relates to the Trans-Pacific trade. And domestic intermodal spot rates are down about 12.5%. Uh, you know, that's based on Intech freight logistics data. That's also, um, you know, they're down, like I said, around 12.5%. And that's after around a 21% decline last year. You know, rates are being pressured by all the things we talked about, by weak demand, increased truck competition, and lower fuel surcharges. Intermodal volume has declined about 10% this year as supply chains grapple with that, the headlines created by the coronavirus pandemic. And, you know, volumes 
have been pressured as prolonged factory closes, uh, closings in China were followed by weak economic demand in Europe and North America as uh, COVID-19 moved across the globe. You know, intermodal is, uh, is facing increased competition from the slack trucking capacity, uh, an hour or a dollar discount, and, and lower fuel surcharges. And, you know, how that, that concludes my uh, prepared remarks, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have during the Q&A portion uh, of the program. Terrific. Thank you so much, Lee. I really appreciate that. Next, I want to turn it over to Pat, and Pat's going to be able to dig in a little bit deeper into how intermodal is. So without further ado, over to you, Pat. Thank you, Hal, and everybody. Uh, good morning from the Chicago suburbs, and uh, sorry that you aren't all here this week, but uh, hopefully that'll happen next year again, and uh, thanks for joining us. Okay, so we have uh, the intermodal volume from 2019. Some of you may have seen this before, but we do want to uh, remind you about what this is. There was negative growth in 2019 before the COVID-19 happened. It was negative for both um, international and domestic loads, and particularly very negative for trailers that are a small share right now of uh, intermodal, but uh, have bounced up and down quite a bit. We'll see where that goes. So uh, monthly volume. So we see that uh, container imports were up very slightly in 2019. After that, it had grown like 3 to 5% most of the time. A lot of that was trade tensions with uh, with China over that period of time. And also quite a few of the imports moved from the West Coast to the East Coast. And a lot, smaller share of those moved by intermodal inland. Less than half of what does on the West Coast does so on the East Coast. So that does pull things down quite a little bit. And we'll see where that goes. And then uh, you know, domestic containers uh, also fell in, uh, this uh, past year as um, trucking had greater capacity, lower prices. That was quite an impact on that. And uh, as many of you may know, significant part of domestic container volume uh, is imports that are transloaded on the West Coast from an international container to a domestic container. And so uh, that too was a factor. And then uh, trailers turned back down after uh, climbing quite a bit in 2017, late 2017, early 2018. Um, and we'll see where that goes over time. You can see for uh, the origin regions that uh, almost all of them were negative in 2019, except for the Mountain Central, which is the smallest one. Uh, everything else was down quite a bit, um, in particular uh, on the uh, on the Southwest, for example, which is one of the biggest parts of it, and the Midwest as well. Um, others were a smaller decline, but uh, again, things did turn down quite a bit uh, in all origin regions, except for that smallest one. We see the lanes where, uh, where the growth happened, um, and much of that growth was to and from US and Canada. And uh, as many of you may know that the, uh, the containers that are imported to the Canadian ports, many of that comes into the US and then empties or loaded containers go back to Canada. So you see uh, that several of those lanes that have been growing uh, are to and from Canada. Um, and then also uh, intra Southeast, a lot that came to the ports there and moved to the cities in the Southeast uh, were part of that as well. Um, and intra Midwest, a little bit of growth there as well. Uh, so you see that um, the biggest decline was from the Southwest to both the Midwest and the South Central. And a lot of that was that shift of imported containers to the West Coast uh, over to the East Coast that reduced the volume that moved from there. And uh, also from the Midwest back to the Southwest, that was a part of it as well. Okay, let's move on to 2020. So you see that uh, domestic containers in the first quarter uh, were doing pretty well compared to uh, what they did in 2019, uh, but very negative for uh, trailers and international containers and total intermodal down quite a bit in, uh, in 2020 in the first quarter. Next slide will show you what uh, happened monthly. So you see that domestic containers grew in, in January and February and felt just a little bit in, uh, in March, and we'll see where that goes going forward. But you see that uh, there was quite a turn down in international containers from what happened in January to February, and then down even more to March 
and much of that was because of COVID-19, but also still reflected the tariffs uh, that had affected that as well. Also, of course, the share of imports to the U.S. East Coast continued to rise in the first quarter of 2020, and that has an impact on that as well. And then uh, trailer volume fell even more quickly than it did in 2019, and uh, there's some conversions that involve that. So on the next slide, you see that almost all of those origin regions uh, were negative as well in the uh, first quarter of 2020. Mexico was, uh, again, one of the smaller ones, had a significant growth, but uh, a tiny part of total North American intermodal. Uh, almost uh, everything else was down you know, from 5 to 10% for the most part in uh, that first quarter of 2020 from all of those regions. Uh, so the next one, you see the lanes where uh, they were negative, and uh, a lot of that was between uh, the West Coast and uh, the Midwest, or the Southwest, and um, I'm sorry, the South Central. And so uh, a lot of that, again, reflected the huge impact on imports that were part of that as well. And then a little bit of a decline, too, from the Midwest to Western Canada uh, was part of that. And then we have a few uh, lanes on the next slide that did have some growth, uh, especially within Mexico, as we saw that uh, Mexican volume rose, but very few lanes had any significant increases in the first quarter of 2020. So now we'll talk a little bit more about where things are going for the rest of the year. Um, you can see the Chinese tariffs that started in, uh, in mid-2018 had trended up quite a bit until the end of uh, last year and down just a little bit in the first quarter of this year. Um, and it is a great question whether, as an effect of COVID-19, uh, will things change again in the tariffs? Will they will tariffs go up quite a bit again or go down quite a bit again? It's very hard to predict that, but that does have an impact on intermodal for sure. And then if you look at that next slide, uh, you see that share of imports of containers moving uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast uh, in both the U.S. and Canada. Um, and we expect that shift to continue through this year and even through the next couple years. Um, and that, too, will have an impact on intermodal, and we'll see where that goes. And it's not that there is no, as I said, intermodal that's moved from the East Coast ports inland by intermodal uh, on rail, but uh, it's not as much as from the West Coast. Next slide shows you the import forecast that we've seen and uh, quite a bit of negative forecasts, both with um, less demand and uh, early this year, less supply when things were shut down. Uh, we'll see how that goes as we move forward. And then the next slide shows you that uh, U.S. trucking capacity uh, is very low right now and uh, U.S. dry van truck rate index uh, has fallen to well below the long-term 10-year average. Um, and that means that uh, it's going to be more difficult for intermodal to compete with trucking uh, during 2020 because of that. Uh, at some point, that will turn back up again, uh, but it's not expected to happen this year. Next slide does show you a conversion of TOFC to COFC for refrigerated containers, and uh, that has been part, a significant part of the drop in trailers that are moving on uh, intermodal uh, because so many of those uh, going back shortly were trailers. Now they're moving to containers. You can see that on a train. That's a very important part of things that are going on. So next slide, um, as we all know that uh, online orders are a very big part of what purchasing is going on right now, but we do see at this Amazon warehouse in California uh, that uh, several of those are COFC containers. And um, we do not think that intermodal volume has gone down quite a bit because of online shopping. We, we will certainly keep tracking that and see where things go with that as we move forward. But um, it is good to see that uh, that is being shipped by Amazon and others that are doing online selling uh, by intermodal. And we'll see where that goes over time as well. And then we'll talk about the full year 2020. So this is a very difficult period to predict what's going to happen uh, throughout almost all the history of intermodal. And many, many things have, have affected it. You know, weak economy because of COVID-19 is part of it. Uh, but the trade war is at least continuing so far. We'll see 
if that changes or not, where things move from China to other places that still move by intermodal. At least so far, not a lot has come back to production in the U.S. A lot of that was when we had very tight employment, but that could change as things move forward. Uh, very low fuel prices and significant trucking capacity are part of it. Um, and uh, there could be double-digit intermodal declines for most of 2020, um, unless things turn around very quickly. And also, what, what do the railroads do? You know, do they want to do service improvements and get volume gains? I mean, they've done a lot of service improvements over the last couple of years, and that has had some impact on the reduction in intermodal. But when will those railroads try to increase volume in their mold going forward. We'll see where that happens. Could happen quite a bit in the second half of 2020 if our economy does uh, recover quite a bit during that period. And auto production, uh, will that turn back up as well? And we're seeing some things that are suggesting, yes, that will happen. And uh, you know, auto parts are moved quite a bit by intermodal, both imports and domestically. And uh, we'll see where that goes as well. Uh, so moving to our last slide, you know, we will continue to ship from China and to the U.S. East Coast. Will that continue? And will that mean that, that IPI volumes will continue to decline? Or uh, do we have a change in tariffs so that it rises or drops significantly? And um, we have not, since the COVID-19, seen a big change in the tariffs. But would that happen? Who knows for sure uh, where that will go? And I uh, would certainly welcome any opinions about where that has gone. And that has not really, as mentioned, increased domestic production yet in a meaningful way to boost domestic intermodal. Uh, but that could happen for many different ways. And then we do have a concern about that uh, legislative threat about truck size and weight uh, moving up, uh, especially twin 33-foot trailers. That would have tougher competition than intermodal when that happened. And uh, we'll see where that goes. And then, uh, you know, as intermodal improves, do trailer loads continue to decline or do they turn back around again? And uh, as I've mentioned before, trailer loads in, in recent years have been fairly volatile, uh, but a fairly small share of intermodal. Right now, they're about uh, 7 to 8% of intermodal. If you go way back uh, to, uh, you know, 30 years ago, it was about 60% of intermodal volume that was trailers. Now it's only, the, as I said, 7 to 8 percent. And uh, would that turn back up again, or is it going to be more and more and more share of uh, containers rather than trailers as things move forward? Uh, so that's the last slide I have, and uh, we certainly look forward to the questions that uh, any of you have about this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pat. I really appreciate that. We've heard from two economic experts. We're lucky to actually be joined by a couple of more John Woodcock and Peter Wolf uh, from TTX Company are going to jump in as well now, and we're going to start tackling some of the questions along with Pat and, and Lee. So we'll go right ahead and dive in with one that probably for Lee, uh, Pat, you touched a little bit on it, but you say, we haven't heard quite as much about the trade war with coronavirus taking up most of the conversation. Is there any indication that the taxes on imported goods and other self-inflicted wounds are going to be letting up any time in the future? So I was going to say my, my cracked and uh, foggy crystal ball is, is telling me that, you know, that given the rhetoric out of the White House towards China is kind of increasing with the spread of the coronavirus and, you know, people uh, playing the, the blame game. I don't see tariffs kind of uh, coming off at a quick rate anytime soon. At least that's kind of uh, my perception of things. Yeah, and it'd be very uh, difficult to predict when and if that will change uh, going forward. Is that a political issue that we need to deal with? Is that related to the COVID-19? Will any of that change? And also, if tariffs do go up more and more for China, does production move to other East Asian countries, as we've seen very much happen in the past? Or does any of that production come back to the U.S. now that we have uh, very high unemployment? Could that be different than what it was in recent years? Right. Here's, a, here's another one kind of similarly placed, but going big picture now. With the dramatic downturn in the, that the economy has taken, what does a recovery actually look like? Are we looking at potential of a new normal? So this is Lee, and, you know, from, from what we gather, I mean, it's definitely not going to be a, a V-shaped recovery. 
you know, probably more of a, a U or a W, if you will, with fits and starts, uh, or, you know, things just getting slowly not as bad as they will be in the second quarter. So that will really depend on the length of the the virus's impact here in the United States. You know, if these all of these stay-at-home orders, if they work and, you know, we flatten the curve, uh, and we don't get, you know, an increase in cases in, in the fall, you know, uh, it, it, it kind of would probably be a best case scenario for for the economy. Yeah, we would agree there's not going to be that V shift uh, happening anytime soon. Probably not going to. Okay. Here's one a little more domestically oriented. The CARES Act legislation heavily focused on passenger, air, and cargo, the small amount going towards rail. Uh, what specific legislation, if any, do you think Congress might implement for trucking and intermodal? Will there potentially be anything further for rail? I would yield the floor on that. And the only thing I would say is, is the rails are, are pretty uh, in, in good shape financially, so uh, they don't really need any financial help. I mean, they're still pretty have pretty solid uh, even margins, uh, even with uh, the decline in uh, in volumes. This is this is John Woodcock. Yeah, um, Hal, I'd, I'm not too familiar with with any pending legislation. I think the only thing I would comment on is that uh, the trucking industry was able to relax some of the current regulations that are in place with regard to hours of service and uh, truckload weight. It was done both on a federal and on a state level. But all of the, uh, to my knowledge, all of the um, waivers and relaxation of the regulations were on a temporary basis. And if they haven't expired already, they would be expiring in the next uh, couple of months. Okay, great. Here's one. Uh, do we feel like we've hit the bottom of the shuttered production in China and the blank sailings from China and other Asian ports? Or is there maybe more to come? I think that that may be a little bit hard to say. I think in terms of how the virus has run its course in China, what we hear is the factories have resumed production, but then there's weak demand in, in the U.S. So it's really hard to say where that's necessarily going to run or whether it is as China uh, reopens uh, its cities and places where it's been really hard hit, is the virus going to return? But I think it's it's fair to say, at least as of this particular moment, production is is up and running in China to the extent that there's demand for the goods to be produced. Here's a quick one. What guesses uh, do y'all have on when consumer confidence might start gaining momentum again? <laughs> I, I mean, this is a uh, league, and it, and you know, it's really all going to be based on unemployment. You know, when you have uh, double-digit unemployment rates, you know, people aren't um, going to want to go out and you know buy anything that's not essential. You know, even discretionary spending, like the auto, like to buy a car. You know, while like production, you know, we might be hearing production might be coming back. The, the bigger question is who's going to be buying these cars if, you know, 20 percent of the people are, are out of work. And even if you do need a car, you might, you know, probably get a, a better deal in the used market. So the automotive industry is extremely important to the U.S. economy. But, you know, I don't see that coming back uh, anytime quickly. I think that's going to be, you know, a slow kind of turn on because of the fact that, uh, you know, consumers aren't going to have this huge appetite in you know, the consumer confidence. Uh, numbers will improve as unemployment uh, rates go down and as people get back to work and things normalize. You know, right now, uh, there's nothing normal about, you know, what we're all doing. We're all doing a webinar from our own houses <laughs> as opposed yeah. to being all together in Chicago. Um, so everything is, you know, this is, this, is, this is not normal and this is, you know, kind of shatters consumers uh, to their core in, 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 in my view. Yes, and we would agree with what uh, Lee had said about that. It's very important for people to get their jobs back before anything happens. Can you expand on the shift in import volumes to the East Coast? Uh, are the reasons tied to the operations costs on the West Coast, or is there a fundamental shift in the international trade routes, and is it expected to continue? It may be more of a fundamental shift than anything else, but how long that fundamental shift remains in place is questionable. So that may mean it's not a fundamental shift. So I know that's a very confusing answer, but it seems that tariffs have pushed a lot of manufacturing away from China. And as Pat alluded to earlier, we really don't know where tariffs are going to go. Are they going to increase? Are they going to decrease? 
And if they go away, then maybe that means this uh, shift that we've seen away from China to production in other parts of the world, particularly South and East Asia, where there's a more, uh, it's a shorter distance to come to the US East Coast than to the West Coast. If that changes in production returns or increases in China and more goods now come back to the West Coast, we could see growth in the West Coast uh, to a greater extent down the road when, when the economy recovers. So uh, like a lot of things going on right now, it's a little bit up in the air, but I don't think it has anything to do with uh, necessarily costs at, at East Coast ports or West Coast ports. I think it has to do with uh, tariffs and uh, uh, moving production away from, from China. Uh, so we'll have to see where, where that goes. I think in, uh, to throw a few numbers at it, I think last year, looking at the peers data, uh, imports from China fell almost 12%. I think the number was about 11.7%. And then if you give me a quick second, I think in the first quarter, imports from China fell almost uh, 22%. Uh, and that's a combination of production really declining in China, and, and particularly in, in late February and March with uh, COVID, um, as well as perhaps some share shift uh, to other places in, in Asia. Also, there is still that large all water share uh, from China to the U.S. East Coast. Um, more than a third of what originates in China goes through the Panama Canal to, uh, to the East Coast. And uh, that could change down the road. One thing I've always said for many years, uh, the Panama Canal has competitors, uh, UP, BNS, FCP, and CN. Um, if they want to try to get things back to the West Coast, they might be able to do that as well. Okay. How much manufacturing would actually um, shift back to the U.S.? Uh, and if not, where do we see that shift going to? So I, I caught the tail end of the question. Uh, you, you're cutting in and out. But, uh, you, you know, we don't see a wholesale shift of manufacturing coming back to the U.S. Um, you know, I think that what this pandemic has taught people is that diversification is good. And, you know, the winners of that diversification probably would be, you know, other Southeast Asia countries like Vietnam, um, countries like India, uh, Mexico. Those would be probably the, the bigger winners than necessarily a wholesale shift of stuff coming to the U.S. That's not to say some things aren't going to maybe come back here or people might think differently about uh, diversifying, you know, their supply chains. They have some stuff here, but maybe most of it in, in, in lower cost countries. But, you know, I think it's definitely going to change supply chain uh, on a more permanent basis. Um, but like I said, I don't think it's going to be like a, a knee jerk shift to, uh, you know, move everything back uh, into the U.S. Following on from that, the question is, what about the U.S. MCA, the sort of new and approved NAFTA uh, being ratified in July? Would that affect cross-border intermodal? And might that help with a shift to um, luring more production back to the U.S.? I mean, I don't think it necessarily would bring more production back to the U.S. I think it, it would, uh, you know, uh, dissolve some uncertainty that's in the market as relating to U.S.-Mexico trade relations, which is good for manufacturing and it's good for people that want to make investments in Mexico for, um, you know, products that might uh, end up in the U.S. You know, it is a, probably a net positive to intermodal, but I, I don't necessarily necessarily think it's going to, um, you know, drive significant uh, volume, cross-border volumes. Uh, you know, cross-border has been a real growth driver for Kansas City Southern and Union Pacific. You know, it's been growing at, you know, uh, more than, um, you know, their, their, their other businesses. Um, that, that has had some impacts, you know, uh, related to the automotive industry uh, recently. Um, but, you know, um, as these, you know, as the trade agreements are, are passed, you know, it will provide some degree of clarity, uh, you know, for manufacturers out there. And uh, I would think that USMCA is pretty much staying the same as uh, what we were in the past, rather than putting tariffs on something like that. And uh, so, you know, you should see some growth over time in intermodal across the borders, but not a significant surge in that. Here's an interesting one. Um, many of the customers that I've come across uh, that have decided not to buy haven't bought from the competition, but rather are having issues with getting funded. Uh, financial barriers are uh, 
have a big or might be the biggest barrier on competition in in this person's business. Uh, so I'm assuming they're a broker, but it's probably transferable to other areas. So what's your view on, on folks' actual access to funding that might pose a continuing problem for the economy? You know, from my perspective, um, you know, obviously it's a, it's, it's a, it's going to have a, of a huge impact, you know, all these SBA loans that uh, the government programs that were, you know, pushing through or um, supposedly help to, to relieve some of that. But, you know, that is going to be a, a major issue. You know, people's liquidity and, 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 and access to capital is going to drive, you know, a, a lot of small businesses out, you know, in the trucking industry. Uh, you know, if you're a shipper, you're probably not going to want to deal with someone that uh, is having financial struggles. You want to make sure, you know, your freight doesn't get held up or lost somewhere. Um, so you'll probably focus, you know, provide like capacity providers uh, that have good uh, financial fundamentals and good balance sheets. You know, uh, like many of the, the large publicly traded folks have, uh, you know, great liquidity and great balance sheets uh, for the most part. Super. Are there any sectors that are poised to see gains in intermodal as the economy opens back up? Well, I think you will see more imports as the economy opens back up and the demand rises. Um, and so that would certainly have an impact on that. Um, and then if, um, as the uh, economy improves and prices go back up and production is higher, um, the share from uh, truck to intermodal should shift back a little bit over time. Here's one um, about retail, which I think is, is probably kind of in everyone's court there. Um, retail, which seemed uh, pretty anemic prior to the pandemic, uh, has taken a massive hit. How bad will it continue to be for retail, and what might that mean for intermodal? I mean, generally speaking, you know, the, the mall of America, not the, the mall of America, but malls in America are, you know, dying if you're, if you're you know, uh, not a class A uh, property. So, uh, and that's kind of, uh, you know, what we've seen during the pandemic is, um, you know, that kind of getting exasperated um, because of, you know, increased use of e-commerce and everyone, you know, buying online. You know, I think what, what, what will result is that, you know, not only will supply chains um, change, uh, but, you know, people's buying habits will change as well. Um, you know, so you don't necessarily need the kind of retail footprint uh, that you had in the past. So you can operate with, with much uh, smaller stores or, or no stores. You know, there's some um, retailers, I think it was, um, the, the, the Harry, it was Harry and David or David and Harry, the fruit guys. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're after this. They're like, we don't need to have retail stores anymore. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not part of our business model anymore. We can just do everything, uh, you know, online. And you could see more and more of that, or just you know stores having uh, more experience um, uh, retail uh, outlets at you know at, in major cities, and and that's about it. You know, like like you see with some of the Nike stores uh, around the country. So we think that um, online retail has not had a big po or negative impact on intermodal so far, uh, but you know as that rises quite a bit, how does the supply chain? evolve over time and see then uh, what that does but our expectation at least at this point is no if it's if bought from amazon instead of from a retail store is that going to cut back intermodal quite a bit we don't think so right sneak this last one in if there is a surge in bankruptcies and consolidation and transportation companies how will this um, affect intermodal and how will intermodal fare I mean, I mean, this is uh, this is Lee, and, and from my perspective, you know, the bankruptcies are probably going to be more prevalent um, with maybe smaller brokers or smaller trucking companies, you know, not necessarily on the rail side. And so, you know, if more and more trucking capacity comes out of the market and demand snaps back eventually, uh, you know, you could see an increase in rates, um, which have been, you know, really hampered over the last uh call it 18 months, um, you know, we've seen that weakness. So uh, maybe you can get more normalized rates. So, uh, you know, obviously trucking rates are, are more expensive. Intermodal is probably going to get more expensive as well uh, and put positive uh, pressures uh, on, on intermodal rates uh, also. And, um, you know, and, then, and that just is another 
opportunity for intermodal to, to I guess, win share uh, against trucking if there's going to be less trucking capacity out there. Uh, but on the flip side of that, you know, it, it, uh, trucking has very low barriers to entry. So, you know, once rates become, quote unquote, attractive for people, um, you know, they can go and, and, and maybe lease a used vehicle or, you know, buy a used truck and get back into the market with uh, the technology that's out there with, uh, you know, a lot of the online brokers that are providing, you know, mobile technology, uh, you can kind of uh, compete more with, with the larger carriers, at least in, in a positive uh, freight environment, or rate environment, excuse me. Yes, well, certainly is there any automation in the trucking industry uh, coming anytime soon? Um, not sure about that, uh, but that could have an impact as well on where things go and uh, how would intermodal automate as well to compete with that. So that's something that is not tomorrow, it's not something as soon as the COVID-19 goes away, but uh, it is something to consider down the road. Alex, John, if I could jump in and add a little bit too. The uh, the introduction of the um, uh, the North America, or I should say the U.S. Drug Clearinghouse um, database by the FMCSA in uh, 2020, uh, came with it an expectation that uh, there would be lower driver turnover uh, because every time a driver goes to a new carrier, they have to be drug tested and uh, any positive results that come from that have to be registered in the drug database. So, uh, and they were thinking that drivers are going to stay put ra rather than risk getting a positive drug test. And so increased churn through bankruptcy may actually force in increased churn and uh, drivers applying an increased incidence of, of, of positive drug tests, possibly pulling down some of the driver, the available driver population. That makes sense and is, is good insight to kind of round that out. Well, I wish we could keep going, but we're, uh, we're out of time. Um, I'd like to thank Pat and Lee for the great presentations. Uh, Peter and John, thank you for coming in and helping out with the Q&A. Um, very much appreciate it. I'd like to uh, just let people know that if they're interested in digging deeper into those the data, a lot of which uh, fueled uh, things that, that Lee and Pat uh, both talked about, the IANA data set, uh, the ETSO database is, is available, uh, as well as um, our new volume analyzer, which is a sort of an easy way to take a, take a look at the data. Uh, those are both uh, available uh, if you just go to intermodal.org. Um, look for our data products. Uh, they're available there. Uh, you can also just email us at info at intermodal.org and we'll get back to you uh, with any information. Again, I'd like to thank our year-long sponsors uh, for the support of this webinar, our year-long webinar program, uh, and a lot of other uh, programs that all the IANA membership uh, rely on. Uh, it's, a, it's a great service that they do and we really appreciate the support and we know that uh, all of the, the members uh, appreciate all the, the work that they do to, uh, to, to help us out. And with that, I will bid you all a good afternoon and be safe.